Once upon a time, there was a Chinese farmer who uh, lost a horse, ran away. And all the neighbors came round that evening and said, that's too bad. And he said, maybe. The next day, the horse came back and brought seven wild horses with it. And all the neighbors came around and said, why, that's great, isn't it? And he said, maybe. The next day, his son was attempting to tame one of these horses and was riding it and was thrown and broke his leg. And all the neighbors came around in the evening and said, well, that's too bad, isn't it? And the farmer said, maybe. And the next day, the conscription officers came around looking for people for the army. And they rejected his son because he had a broken leg. And all the neighbors came around that evening and said, isn't that wonderful? And he said, maybe. <laughs> so you brought this up. We started talking frame about it. this. Frame it. This is a frame oh, problem. Say, I, it, it, I was going to say, this is the frame problem. You brought it up as the frame problem. And so, so Paul... Vander Clay is talking about the different frames that we have, um, and and when you realize that you're you're bringing sort of uh, assumptions and stuff to the world as you as you perceive it, um, and think about it, and think about it, mm. then then you're you're always within sort of this frame, sort of everything's framed by your own whatever, your own consciousness somehow. And, and this is a problem because, well, why is it a problem? Well, what, you know, when Luke said think about it, I think that's really important because to me, that's when Adam and Eve see their nakedness, right? That's the casting down of the eyes. That's what that is. And, and the lack of transcendence. Because that's what happens when they, that's the actual movement when Adam and Eve fall into multiplicity, right? Mm -hmm. Like imagine being, this is like D Douglas Harding's, you know, toddler to teenager thing, right? Where the toddler doesn't know who he is. He's not looking at his multiplicity, right? He's just, you know, the parents put him in the mirror and say, look, that's you, Bobby. And he goes, okay, just to make his parents happy, right? Um, but then suddenly the teenager sees themselves in the mirror and that's that same downcasting of the eyes, right? And Douglas Harding says, that's when, you, when you, you think you are what you look like and what you look like is dying, right? Um, so you... You're, you're not seeing anything sacred. You're not seeing anything eternal. You're not seeing anything transcendent. You're just seeing this material body that's looking at you through, you know, th that you're looking at through your eyes. And I think everyone has that sense that when they look in a mirror, they're looking at something, not with it. Like right? an object, yeah. Right. And, and so... And the, and the transcendent would, and the transcendent is going to be that which is just outside the frame. Oh, well, and this reminds me oh. of Sherry when you were talking about because um, something that comes up all the time is your, <clears throat> you know, your First Nations look around thing. Mm -hmm. But when you were talking about that one day peripheral vision, and when you look up, it activates like your the pineal gland and your third eye. Like remember, like that's very when you look up when you're not just like this inward myopic focus and you look up, you're simultaneously looking at something, but you're also seeing, not seeing other things in your periphery. You're seeing the thing you're looking at, but you're also seeing everything else. And it's a, uh, you're, that's when you're actually looking. Yeah. It's an awareness of everything around you. <laughs> and, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how I fra phrased it this morning, but there's, you know, like there's a unity in God, right? God is everything, filling all things. And 
And then there's this multiplicity below, but it is also unified in the sense that it's connected. Like if you think about Indra's net, Indra's net is this net, it's a web of, of, of a net. And there are these little jewels, right? And they're, they're, they're where the, the net converges, right? All those points. And, and you could think of them in this case as, as human beings, for example. And all those little gems could think that they're the only gem on the net. But when they look around, right? then they start to see that they're actually connected to all the other gems on the net. Yeah. What was that? Um, So Peugeot was talking to James Lindsay and Benjamin Boyce last night. Who cares phone? (laughs) And he was talking, just ignore it. No one cares. No one that matters has my number. (laughs) Um, And, uh, I just want to bring up that triangle. Do you guys know what that triangle is of all the interconnecting triangles? It reminds me of when, um, when, uh, oh, almond tree, Jason was talking about, you guys remember when he was talking about the star of David and the triangle? Yeah. It's like that, but there's a triangle and there's some name for it. James Lindsay brought it up. It's a oh, triangle composed of other triangles and it's a fractal pattern, but that reminds me also of, of the net, you know, it's, it's all these connecting patterns and, um, Another way to think of these things that I really like that I would like to riff on with you guys is we're talking about this morning with Chad because he made his new video I thought was really good. And he was he connected a couple clips. It was Peugeot talking with Brett Weinstein and then some Jordan Peterson clip. And they were talking about perception, essentially. And and Peugeot was trying to talk about faith. And I Mm I nuanced or modified a little bit what Peugeot was talking about because I think it's all faith. Peugeot was essentially saying anytime you level up, so anytime you go from analysis of the things that you know and see, the multiplicity, he said anytime you level up and you have the correspondent unity of the whatever thing you're seeing, he said that's faith because that level up is something, is a level that you can't see and name. It's essentially mystical. Like this is why I say like everyone is mystical whether or not they know it because that is the unnamed thing that it that is the matrix or the womb or the unification behind anything that you're talking about and um but but all of that is faith and that's that's kind of what nate said i think in one of the meditations of the tarot talk when he was just like your imagination is that organ that perceives the essences the unity of a thing but it's inarticulable because anytime you name it you again you fall into the multiplicity whenever you name it you're you're that's, back that's, into that's a, you that's you grabbing onto it so that you, it. yeah comprehend is the same yeah. as apprehend right yeah. so so and and you have but you have to you otherwise it doesn't exist right like try to name something name an animal that or or describe an animal that has no name <laughs> you can't you, you, your first question is well what one <laughs> Because you want to name it, right? Right. Well, and this even gets into weird Trinitarian theology. This is why I've, like, Nate and I have talked about God being beyond being. Because God, the Father, is that ineffable thing that is the same as nothingness that's beyond being. Because he's unnameable. You can't name him. You only name him in Christ. But then that is the manifest name. But what if nothingness is actually everything? Well, it is. Right. Because, Because it can't be named. Right. Because there's much of it. That's the thing. Yeah. And that gets into like the whole, the non-duality thing, which contains duality because it's day and night, which, but that, but those two halves are part of a whole, which is like a day, but then you keep, you can keep leveling up. The day is part of something bigger and something bigger and something bigger until you get to the unnameable thing that is beyond all things. Which is, which is what happens when children ask you why over and over. Yeah, that was a, that's, yeah. that's that fractal tunnel that you end up falling, you know, or mine shaft or whatever. <laughs> it feels like a mine shaft when it's a three-year-old, you know, and you're just like, ah, I can't, you know, and then you finally get to the thing that you can't name. Right at the bottom of it. Um, I I wanted to get back to, um, like Jess said, how do you get out of the frame problem? Yeah. Right? 
And, and I think it's just as simple as wishing upon a star if I want to steal one of Jordan Peterson's <laughs> things, right? This is why he emphasizes this. And I'm surprised that Paul hasn't picked up on that because, because that's the lifting of the downcast eyes, right? Off of the multiplicity and onto the unity, the thing. It's not just a wish. It's, it's a faith. That is that leap, right? Where you go from that which is below to that which is above. That's what you're doing in that, in that movement. And, um, and then your, your, your vision, your field of vision is expanded to everything around it, right? So everything opens up to you and you have, and you're, you're faced with nothing but potential. And perhaps that's why you can wish, right? Because a wish is something that you're pulling out of the potential. That's what you're doing. It, you know, it represents, like when you make a wish, someone will say to you, here, make a wish, throw this penny in the fountain and make a wish. You can think of anything, right? This is the one, one time in your whole life where you can just say the dumbest thing. It's all there. Because a wish is almost- It's infinite. Free of, free of constraint. Right. It's like, just pretend. <laughs> right. But that is Wish. the transcendent, right? Because it is, it is the nothing that is everything. Yeah. And that's kind of where imagination plays. This is why imagination is probably so important because you, that's, that's what dreaming is. I mean, even, you know, to dream it's to, it's to enter that place that is, beyond your comprehension you know mm -hmm. um and i think it's the wishing on a star what, what's great is it it'll you wish for the for the heavenly for the things above you but then that also just will then in turn permeate all the lower things because that's what i was trying to say to chad this morning right like even this is where i'd push on peugeot and say like even the naming of the multiplicity and the thinking of the multiplicity is still faith because the fact is to quote george mcdonald that no man understands anything like we don't know any of this stuff is either just because we name it, like you say chair, you don't know what the hell that is. Like it's a, it's a, you, you can just, you can keep going down the fractal levels. Like you can break it apart into lower and lower and lower and lower multiplicities. But when you get all the way to the bottom of that, where you can't go any lower, you know, quarks, leptons, uptons, but whatever, like, you don't know what the hell that is. It's just something you call it. You know, you don't know what matter is. You don't know what anything is. We just think we do. It's all, it's this, ego game that we're playing yeah so <clears throat> um there was uh oh, there was i had a thought yeah what i wanted to what i wanted to throw out there was how does how does th what we're talking about matter in the world like when you're moving around with people that you love how does this matter? Judgment. This is where I want to take it. Right. Judgment and, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, we, we've been talking about that lately, and I think this is why it's really so important, because it gets into, I think when you, so the full quote, that George McDonald quote that I love so much is the fact is no man understands anything when he understands that, that fact. Mm -hmm. That is his first tottering step, not towards understanding, but towards the capacity of one day understanding. Um, and, uh, and I think why it's important is like this, this gets into what you were talking about yesterday. Humility, that humility and courage yeah. to walk on the water and also to walk on the water, but simultaneously to get out of the place of judgment of your brother and yourself so that you can actually live. Because I'm of the belief that when you're, when you're in this mode of being of analysis and thinking that you understand things and, and when you're stuck in the du duality, the binary of the duality, and you can't see outside of that, like you have no periphery third eye stuff going on, nothing that can transcend your analysis that will, you, you will be stuck in a hell of, of judgment, both of yourself and of other things and of all sorts of stuff. Even with little things like what comes to my mind right now is, 
Jesus sleeping in the boat and yeah. the storm is raging. Okay. Yeah. This is a man who has, he's not judging anything. He's just, <laughs> he's just sleeping. And then they wake him up in a panic because why? Because what's happening to them is bad. Okay. Scary. They made a judgment scary. on it. Yeah. It's scary. It's bad. Okay. And Jesus says, what's your problem? It's, it's neither, right? It isn't anything. It just is, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think that that's why, why he, he says that, because how, how do I put this? No matter the outcome, everything is going to be what it's going to be, right? Yeah. Because yeah. there is a telos. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, in this case, I want to kind of just keep it to, to a simple case of judgment, not a judgment on a person or a judgment on an idea necessarily, but just a judgment on a situation where someone is judging it to be bad. Of course we do that. And, and we need to do that to act. Okay. Mm -hmm. We need the capacity to act and we, we, we're able to do that by judging something, right? Is that ice thin? Is it going to hold my weight? You know, is this, is this not going to happen? Yeah. And, but, but ultimately, if you get the, you know, 30,000 foot view, even if the ice is thin and you think it's thick and you go through it, the end game <laughs> Is it, it's gonna it's gonna wrap that whole thing up in in its unity, right? This is the undergirding or the geborgenheit of God, and that's unnameable and inarticulable and beyond your comprehension, which is like which gets into Job stuff. So so this is where I would, and that's faith to me. Ultimately, it's this yeah. it's this idea that God is good but it's not a good, it's not a good that can even be named because, because you don't, it might, it might look real bad. Right. Like, like that's why I said yesterday, if Sam Harris was to ask me why I think God is good right. when, you know, he makes his list of horrific events, I wouldn't be able to answer him in a way that he would want me to. Okay? Yeah. He wouldn't, it's not that he couldn't understand it. And I think this is also important. You know, like I mentioned also yesterday that I've seen people wander off into the landscape of pain and suffering um, as Christians and, and just turn back. They don't want to go there. You know, they're like, no, no, I can't explain it. So I'm not going to talk about it. And, and, um, but it's not that they. It's not that they um, couldn't go there. They could. They could walk out into that landscape. They won't. Yeah. That's the problem, and and I think Job did. He walked right out into the landscape of pain and suffering. Right, Jess. Like, would you say? Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. He walked around, he looked around, he picked it up, he felt it, he, you know, and, and he kept coming back to the same conclusion that he was righteous. And he said what he thought. Right, which was that, right? That he was, mm -hmm. <laughs> he was not in the wrong. Um, so essentially, he wasn't going to make a judgment. He wasn't going to call it anything. He wasn't going to call it good. He wasn't going to call it bad. Um, and then, and then when he asked God for an answer, he, he didn't get that answer. He didn't get the judgment answer. Right. He got the unity answer. That's what he got. He got the whole picture and where, and, and somehow he, I think he <clears throat> saw himself in that, right. He saw himself in the whole, the function that he has and that gave him a reason to live. Yeah, well, this goes, I want to see what Jess says, because this gets at really, this goes into areas where 
most Christians, especially conservative type Christians, dare not tread because it gets into uh, th- this duality, good and evil, and and all of this being even within within creation and within God, however you want to mess with it. Cause we've been talking too. Jacob's been talking about this on his server lately of like, you know, I am the Lord, your God, I create raw, you know, chaos. Right. And yes, you, you've been really mm-hmm. meditating on that and contemplating well, that dynamic. Yeah. And I, I mean, as far as like the unity of all things, it's, it's also how, how we view that. Is it a unity that's good or not? <laughs> yeah. Right. And and I think that there's a way in which um, a lot of people think that it's there, there's something fundamentally not good in the whole unity of things, and that they've got to protect themselves from it. That that they've got to, you know, it's the you know cowering and turning your head down um, because what's out there, what what is in the transcendent. It's all nothing good. Nothing good can happen out there. Whatever and, I can't see must it's got it's got to be bad. Right. And and all you need is a couple bad experiences to just confirm that for you. Just be like, well, that I can I can say this happened and this happened and this happened. Therefore, there's no ultimate good. The good is within the the small little world that I can sort of frame and control. Um, so, so people, you know, but this is a reciprocal narrowing. This is, this is some, this is something that just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, um, you know, God's speech at the end of Job is simultaneously like terrible, overwhelming and like, speaking of a good that is beyond description mm. like it's all those things at once and god doesn't judge job for his sort of reaction so so job you know first <laughs> kind of laments and and wants to he, you know be uncreated he's like there there was no reason for my life um and and then he kind of has this case against God. He's like, I've been dealt with unjustly. I I'm innocent. And, and I don't, you know, there's people that want to point out, be like, well, Job was wrong. Like yeah. that's, that's not, that's not the point. <laughs> and, and God is, doesn't even condemn Job for that because there, there's something like, when we're going through that, we're going to react in the ways that we do. Sure. And, and he actually condemns the friends, which are actually trying to, uh, to um, defend God, (laughs) which is. And also assert his unrighteousness. Right. And condemn Joe. Impose that on him. It's everybody's everybody's there. Here you go. That's the frame problem is everybody's trying to frame it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and and that's the thing is is like when the transcendent breaks in on you um i think there's two fundamental ways that this happens to everyone that's unescapable one is tragedy and and then one is just awe and wonder and so those are kind of the two ends of the positive and negative <laughs> emotion. Well, and, and often, so what this is ma- reminding me of, often those are the same things. Like, do you guys remember when Jordan Peterson was talking about people? It, it, and this is a matter, it, it is a matter of perspective and time and maturity and all that stuff, though, is he would say often some of the most tragic things that have happened to people in their life, in the moment, they hate and they think this is a terrible thing. Their judgment is like, this is bad. And then down the road, 5, 10, 20, 30 years, their, their assessment and judgment then is this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. This is why, well, this is why I've been thinking about that, po- that parable so much of like the farmer, you know, like we'll yeah, see. Yeah, like what Jess, said, what Jess said, tragedy and awe, yeah. I was thinking here. Terror, because that's what tragedy invokes, right? Terror mm-hmm. and awe. 
And 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 how how often in the Bible is 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 that awe translated as fear? Yeah. Because it contains all that, all that at the same time, right? You have you have this terror and you have yeah. awe. And I get this image of you know the fairy tale where you know the person in the story has to enter the deep dark woods. There's always the deep dark woods. Right. You know? <laughs> Yeah. What and is they that? Go in yeah. And they and they and they battle all their whatever's, you know, their their demons or or actual monsters or whatever, and then they come out on the other side and they're transformed. Mm-hmm. And and that's 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 the pattern. That's the the good pattern of a fairy tale, right? Where they go, they don't go into the deep dark woods and die. You know, Hansel and Gretel go into the deep dark woods and they almost die, but then they kill the witch and you know and the, they're reunited with their family and everything's you know wonderful and they're transformed now now they're smarter they're stronger they're more courageous they're all those things right and and um so we know we know that going into the deep dark woods is a good thing yeah right but who wants to call it that <laughs> yeah. right well it's, they want to call it the cave you fear to enter holds the answer that you seek, you know, Joseph Campbell or whatever. I just want to read this because it came to mind and I think it's all about this, but it's Hebrews 12. So for you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sounds of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Mm. Wow. That wow passage, in, that con- in that context, is that, that, that's amazing. I, have to <clears throat> I mean, that just reminded me of what the, the, the fear and the awe and the trembling. Cause like, that's what it is. I mean, if you think about any biblical reference of even these, of which is, which it always is, I would argue mediated experiences of God. Mm. Like it's what it is. It's it's terrifying, you know. Yeah, and and you know, I also I also would like to reiterate that I think, and I, I feel kind of stupid saying this, but it, it just recently um, became really clear for me that this is what this is what the Bible is about. It's about the contention between good and evil because the. The, the story in Genesis is centered around a tree <laughs> of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Which is the, it, it's the dividing asunder. Um, um, I don't know. I never looked it up. I should have looked it up. But the story of, of Solomon, uh, when he judged which infant was, belonged to the mother, right? Remember the mother, mm-hmm. one mother stole another mother's baby and they yep. both claimed it. And he said, well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to divide it asunder. Right. And then and then the truth came out. And and I think for some reason, I just have a feeling that there's something in there about this idea of judgment, because that's what we do. We divide the thing asunder. Right. And 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 that is actually Diabolos to cast apart. That is what judgment is doing. It's 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 taking it's taking this. And saying and and this and saying this is good and putting it here and this is bad and putting it over there, right? It it divides things apart, and um, and in that what you just read, it 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 says right in there, God is the judge of all, yeah, right, yeah. and it says that for a reason. He's the one who's going to, you know. If, if necessary, cast, cast these apart, but cast them apart in a way that, that, how do I say this? Like he did with the creation story, in a sense, he, he drew out of the chaos, right? 
he pulled the day out of the chaos. He pulled the night out of the chaos. He, you know, so it, it wasn't, he didn't separate in the sense that we think of it in a, in a, in a, you know, um, you know, like you go to your room, that kind of separation. It was a separation, like the multiplicity, oh, I'm going to have a hard time saying this. <laughs> it was, it was a drawing out of the multiplicity out of the unity for the benefit of the creature. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's all yeah. in the service of being right. Like that that's the creative act. Like if, if he didn't separate things, there would not be anything separate from him, but because of the separation, there could actually be something else. And there would be nowhere to live. Right. Right. And he put his breath of life yeah. into Adam. Right. Mm -hmm. So when God judges his judgment to me anyway, is not a, 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 like a divisive kind of judgment. It's not a casting apart, but a drawing out of the chaos. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you know, Christ's Christ's parable of the wheat and the tares, you know, just let them, let them grow up, man. Don't, don't do, don't try and separate them out because you're going to ruin the good if you pull out the bad. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you start thinking about this, then suddenly, yeah. And, and even the parable of the sower, like Jesus doesn't seem to think it's a big deal if some of the seed falls on rocky ground and never sprouts. It's not a big deal to him. We would go, oh, that's bad, you know, and here's the Chinese farmer story, right? Where, where everybody's like, oh, that's good. And then the farmer says, well, maybe, you know, and then something else happens and then they all, oh, that's bad. And he goes, well, maybe. And, you know, and the story, this reality, this, this existence that we have, this life, right, is dynamic. And, and, and I, I really like just to, I'll be bold enough to say that I, I really don't think that we have, you know, to judge is to be God. That's what it is. Right. That's what Satan right. said. You'll be like God. OK, if you if you can learn to do this, knowing good and evil and not in like right. an abstract, I you think, way, but knowing it in reality. Exactly. And so and so I don't think. That we're good at it we're not god <laughs> right yeah this is why right this is why the saints are silent silent right or even if you look at um dostoevsky or like father zosima or something like he's not going around telling everybody like who's right and who's wrong <laughs> right you know, that's not what he, he's falling on his face saying everyone forgive me lord have mercy yeah. <laughs> right yeah yeah Which, and, oh, go ahead. well and i i like you're talking about diabolus is what cast apart um but like the that integration is is a healing process and so right. like there, there's ways in which we're divided that that when things come together in in us it's it, we actually sense it as healing it actually mm -hmm. is healing um, and it, you know, there's something about the human person that, that is able to hold things together within ourselves and, 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 um, to, uh, take those multiplicities and, and, and see them as unities. And, and then those are, those are actually, uh, like, somehow manifest in us. Like it's almost like our co-creative um, capability to, to, to do that in creation. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, but, but, you know, is I'm thinking about this, this frame thing and to there, there's a way in which you can recognize how you see things through a frame, but this idea that you can never kind of peer outside your frame. Like you couldn't come to the edge and kind of like cut through it or nothing on the outside ever like breaks in through to you. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me like it's a, it's, it's sort of um, 
a fatalistic notion that it's trapped. You're well, trapped. Yeah, you, and it's yeah, the, you literally are trapped. It's the it's this is why I say like you can't think yourself out of a prison made of thought. That's the right. accurate postmodern critique and what Kant was talking about, I think, is because what you're saying, like the frame problem, this is why I said to Paul, the frame problem is only a problem if you if you're not present. And then yeah. he replied, like, well, you come back to a room and you're present in the room, but but I said, yeah, but that's but that's but if you're in the room, then then you're present. The only way you're not present in the room is if you're cutting yourself off from the room and looking down and like going into yourself in an, mm -hmm. in a closed off way. And you're stuck in the prison of all your ideas and articulations. Mm -hmm. But the reality is this is this gets into the non dualism is the reality is, is none. We are and we are not there because mm -hmm. anytime you're participating in being this reality of of the coincidence of opposites and the inarticulable is happening all the time because that's what you're interacting with mm -hmm. is like the mystical reality that's beyond your comprehension. Like what the hell do you think you're interacting with? Yeah. Well, this is, this is where Piranesi comes in, right? Because in Piranesi, if, if nobody's read the book, there's, there's a, a, a house. Is it a house? I guess it's a house. Yeah. yeah. But it's like massive. Like it's, huge filled with rooms some miles of the rooms, and miles of house yeah some of the rooms are crumbling and falling apart and uh some of some a lot of the space hasn't yet been explored by piranesi and he lives in this house and he lives a very meager existence actually he's wearing rags and he's eating raw fish and you know <laughs> and climbing up statues to get out of tidal tidal you know tsunamis and all this stuff right mm -hmm. But he's not afraid. He's never afraid. Right. And and he he sees the house as a unity. It's a it's it's a house that it it's benevolent and it's kind. That those are his words to describe the house. And so it it is one giant thing, but it's filled with rooms. And all the rooms are filled with statues. And those statues are people and animals and you know. And and every room has there's something about the room you know like there, there'll be a room where he goes and fishes and there'll be a room where all the seagulls nest and there'll be a room where the you know whatever i can't remember all the details and and so and he explores those rooms but he but there's always a sense in piranesi that that they are parts of a whole that they are never just in and of themselves anything right that they belong to the house and that the house loves him and he responds with love for the house yeah even though even though he's not being treated very well in there <laughs> i mean from all appearances you he know, even know like, that. he could have something to complain he about it he, either. right yeah he has no clue that he's not being treated well right yeah. Because he thinks his clothes, his red <laughs> moss, like he thinks it's great. <laughs> he doesn't think yeah. he's hungry. Yeah. He's loving his life. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what you think. Maybe you can help me with this, Luke, because I'm just thinking, you know, that guy, I can't remember his name anymore, that visits him. The other. Oh, the yeah. Other. He's not interested in the house. He's interested in the rooms because he's looking for something that he wants to possess. Okay. And, and, um, and he's sending Piranesi out because he doesn't want to get lost in the house and Piranesi knows it and is comfortable there. And every now and then he brings Piranesi something beneficial, like a pair of shoes or a sleeping bag or some crackers or whatever, but he's not very generous. <laughs> right. And, and, and I'm just wondering how that maps on to what we're talking about here, because I think it does. I just, it's just interesting because he's really focused on the rooms, this guy. He, he doesn't see the house as a living, breathing organism at all that, that has the capability to undergird someone, right? Yeah. I, I mean, for me, it's like he thinks that he fears the house in some way. Like he right. thinks it's basically dangerous. So he sends Piranesi out because Piranesi is expendable in his eyes. Um, 
he also knows that there's something valuable out there to try to, he's trying to, you know, capture or get for himself. So there's a, this like, you know, and, um, he, he misses, well, that there's a, you know, there, there's a way in which um, Paranasi's love and trust of the house, he, he, know, he knows the house looks on him with love and he looks on love toward the house. And there, you know, this gets into like, it's, you know, so much of our religious stuff is trying to get our own viewpoints correct, correct our frames, we'll say. We're always trying to correct our frames to get a more accurate frame. Like, you know, who is God? You know, you it's it's better to believe God is good than if he's not, you know, this kind of thing. And, and for me, it's kind of missing. Um, the larger question is, how does God see you? Mm. And, and what? Wow, that's really good. Jess. And what frame does God see you in? Mm. Like what? How, how does God frame you? And is this knowing as you were fully known that that's always been, I mean, first Corinthians eight, like that's mm-hmm. knowledge puffs up the love edifies, you know? And if you think, you know, you do not yet know as you ought to know, but if you, but the goal is to be, is to know as you are fully known. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and, so, and a lot of times we will believe that God is good, not because of any goodness that we necessarily have been convinced of, but because he's judgmental and it would be better to believe he's good than not because of his judgment. We see God as, yeah. Or his, or his sovereignty or his, you know, put it, put a name on it. Um, You know, you you can be like, well, God is all powerful. So he, I've got to believe that he's all good or else he's going to squash me like a bug, but already in there is, the whole assumption of how God sees you. Um, That's kind of like, that reminds me of my dream of the house where mm -hmm. as long as I, as long as I act like I'm not afraid of the house and I, and I, you know, I'm like, no happy day. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Then the house won't trap me in it. Right. Yeah. But as soon as I, as soon as I have this weird awareness that, that, that the house is actually, you know, looming and watching Mm -hmm. and I become terrified and then it, it traps me in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, I I think that's exactly it. Yeah. And I think that's what happens. That's the, that's the fear. I mean, in, in very broad strokes, I would say that's the fear that stems from a lack of faith in this ineffable goodness that, I mean, I wouldn't even reduce that to like, what, what you would even conceive of as goodness. Cause what the hell do you know? Right. You no. Know? And so, yeah. but like that here, that here is the thing that then closes you in on yourself and you, and you're stuck, you're trapped. You can't interact with the world anymore. This is what, this is what I think Barfield is talking about. This is when you don't save the appearances. This is mm-hmm. when your ideas become idolatry mm-hmm. because they trap you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, part of this getting to, that point is you almost have to go to the end of your own frame. And so you have to take whatever viewpoint you have and you have to go all the way to the end. And, and you, you know, it's only when you get to the edge of your frame and you peer out, you know, and sometimes those things come crashing down on you. Sometimes it's not something you go and seek, but if you are to seek it, I think you, you basically have to just, uh, go all the way, like whatever, whatever you're doing. That's Um, why I said it's, that's why I made, I made that point that there are people that won't wander into the landscape of pain and suffering. Right. That's that inability to go to the edge of their frame. And voluntarily, but, but eventually I think they'll get there. And this almost, this would bring in like what I think of as, Nate, Nate and Sam are going to talk about this, I think, in tradition and an apocalypse, but like the ideal polar bears or the ideal Christ or the ideal white stone you mm-hmm. like that's 
that is the thing I think that is at the end of the U-shaped journey and it's unavoidable. This gets into like what we were talking about the other day with um, whether you are someone who just like gives in to a libertine licentious lifestyle or, or you are the religious pious rule follower like it does it doesn't necessarily matter because you can like whether or not you want to stick in your frames and just insist on that insist on your own way insist on your own understanding eventually like you will get to the point of and this is like the transcendent pragmatism that i would call just like christian wisdom it -hmm. either works or it doesn't work and so like either either the transcendent imposes itself on you in tragedy and it and it forces a change or Or awe and wonder right or or you naturally follow to the end right of whatever you're doing like the prodigal or Mm -hmm. like the older brother because because both were off yeah but it doesn't matter yeah i mean you're gonna you're gonna get there i mean this is like Jess, you've said that before and I love it. Like you're going to get there because where else, like there isn't anywhere else to go. <laughs> yeah. Ev- God's everywhere. He's down in the, he's at the highest heights in the depths of Sheol. And uh, even, you know, where can I go to hide from him? There, yeah. There's nowhere you can go that what, you know, what people do is they, it, the only thing you can do to hide from God is, is basically this move is where you lower your head and you don't look around <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but even that even that like eventually you're going to die and yeah. guess who's right in the middle of that right <laughs> you know. right this is where the christian story i think i mean and all, like this is where like when i when i talk when i talk about anything i'm talking about everything because like i was talking to joey the other day and we were trying to bring in perennialism because that was initially what i was thinking about talking about was like perennialism and non-duality and joey was just like when you talk about perennialism do you essentially mean Is that what you mean by universalism? And I'm like, well, or non-duality. I'm like, yeah, kind of. It's just all the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) It's the unity of everything. (laughs) Yeah, I don't, I mean, it's just, they're like just different. It's like slightly different takes. It's just like a different word. Yeah. Like what's behind that word is all the same thing. (laughs) You know. Yeah. And and my, my whole thing is like, I don't know how, like, cause I'll see this. And like, I've seen it in my own life and I can tell the stories and I don't know how to make other people see it. And it like, well, the, because the, I think the first question they're going to ask, even watching this conversation, they're going to say, well, how do I, how do I act in, how do I, how do I act in the world? If I can't tell what's right. What do I do? But, but that, but almost that, like, that's a smuggled judgment, right? Sort of. I mean, it's a, it's a legitimate question. I mean, if I want to be fair, it's a legitimate question, right? And and um, and this is why we have multiplicity. I think like this is why, you know, there there it, duality is is not is not it's a part of our existence. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And yeah. and God created us in the environment where we need the particular. Right. We need the multiplicity. But I think that the key is to. Is to, well, like you said yesterday, keep your mouth shut and just. Right. Love. How did you put that? Keep your mouth shut and love everyone. Something like that. Well, and, love and, your enemies. Yeah. Well, see, this when you said that it dawned on me because I had that scene of Christ standing before Pilate where. Yeah, yeah. You know, Pilate's like, are you going to judge this? Are you going to say these people are wrong and you're right? Right? That's essentially what he's asking. And Jesus kept his mouth shut. Okay? He didn't judge it. Yeah. And then Pilate said to him, behold the human being. And, and, and I think this is really important because this is, this is the humanity of Christ the, in the proper orientation right? That is not separating the wheat from the tares. That is not um, calling what's obviously wrong, wrong. He could have, he, like a lot of people are like, why didn't he defend himself? He had every right to, right? But what's so crazy is like, we've talked about this too, like the crucifixion, the passion of Christ 
yeah, it's obviously wrong. And it's also the best thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. <laughs> and the worst thing. <laughs> yes, it's both. Right, which is that which is that coincidence of opposites, yeah. right? Which is that tension that gets that this is the this is the tra- this is where you transcend, okay? Right here. And I think this is how you can act with what you know. So you have these particularities, you have this multiplicity. You can say the crucifixion was bad because look at the horror of it, but you can also say it was good. And and people want to call that a paradox. And just with, you know, when they say paradox, they're actually, what they're doing is they're putting the thing in the broom closet and closing the door. Okay. But what, what do you do with that paradox? Well, that to me, that's the crystal sea. That's where everything becomes solidified and unified all the evil and all the good, right? It all comes together and you can stand on it and, and, and you can walk on water. Okay. Literally. Yeah. And that's how, I think one needs to use this understanding to to deal with the problem of duality and multiplicity and pain and suffering and a good benevolent God. Because you do have those two things. You have pain and suffering and you have a good God. And that's why Sam Harris can make a case. Okay. Ivan, that was when you were talking about Ivan stuff. Yeah, well, Ivan's better than Sam Harris. Right. He's even more dogmatic because he believes in God. Sam Harris just says, well, because of this, I can't believe in this. But Ivan says, I believe in this. And I reject But it. I reject this. Yeah. The pain and the suffering. Right. And so I reject God. Yeah. And, um, and I think that there is, you know, there. this might sound really... I don't know, naive or silly or childish, but that's all good for me. (laughs) That just means it's good. (laughs) But I think the only way to actually transcend, to walk on the water, to allow these things to become the crystal sea for you is, is when you contemplate them. And that means you have to wander into the landscape. Okay. You got to go to the places that you don't want to go to. You got to want to know what you don't want to know. Right. And, and, and then you'll see how, like Jess, Jess talked about healing, right? Well, what is healing? You, you have a, a cut in your skin and suddenly you have two opposites. Mm-hmm. Okay. You have things that oppose each other. They stand against, Right. And what are the, what happens with healing? They knit themselves together. And I think that that's what this is. That's what God is doing. He's given us this, this world of multiplicity, this world of duality for us to contemplate, right? The images, the images of war, the images of clear cut logging, the images of children being brutally raped and murdered. You know, he's given us us all those images and then the beautiful things, you know, the sunset, the Grand Canyon, you know, the ancient tree growing on the side of a cliff. Mm -hmm. And he wants us to knit them together. That's what he wants us to do, I believe, because it's then that we transcend. But as soon as we focus on the particular, we sink into the duality we sink into the multiplicity we sink into the sea like peter did yeah there's a way in which like you want it when you go into <laughs> duality you want to choose one side or the other and and people you'll choose the good or the bad depending on what you think is going to save you or the most powerful or whatever mm-hmm. desire is in your heart but there's a way in which christ brings those two together within himself Mm, so on the on the cross he he holds together both all the evil and all the good and all the world together um and you know i i think that's what we're meant to do is we're meant to hold the dualities together we're meant to hold we're meant to basically hold the world together and and this is to to see the unity in everything um to to witness it and then also 
to, to be able to say that it is good. Like that's the, you know, look on all of creation as God did and say, this is good. Right. What's go with what, what's happening. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not simple. <laughs> um, but I don't think we, you know, you know, you know, going back, going back quickly, just to that image of God saying, this is good. Before he said, this is good. He said, let, let there be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And this is that being a good thing, right? Yep. Let there be, and it is good. And that is really the essence of what we're talking about. Yeah. I think. Being is good. Yep. And, yep. and this is why when I talked about Ivan yesterday, I was saying what Ivan was saying with his speech, when he rejects God, is he, he's actually rejecting his own existence because what he's saying is being is not good. That's what he's saying. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and then Mary reiterates it when she says, let it be unto me, right? And, and we can look at what Mary's situation was and we could say, well, that's not good. <laughs> right. Right. But, but Mary said being is good. Let it be unto me. Right. Mm-hmm. She, she agreed with God that being was good. Yep. What I was thinking about earlier is, and I don't know, this is, this is definitely t- too big of a question for me. And maybe this is, maybe this is too a feel it's related, but um, so then what does, what does the kingdom of God look like or the perusia, the reconciliation of all things when we, when we as saints or the church or the bride of Christ mend the division and reunify the things what is what does reunification look like because if if being in, entails duality and division and night and day and differences what then does what does their and and somehow there that that can be so being is good but somehow that division can can there's a way that it operates that can be not good you know the division is not good so then what does the reconciliation and somehow this is connected to a thing i've been contemplating and i don't even know what it means but it's something that like to me the kingdom of god is when is when all of creation gets to the place of let it be when when we all stop trying to control things and and we say like being is good creation is good god is good and we stop trying to conform everything to our image and to our judgments and the way that we think it should be and then and then simultaneously and i know this makes no sense but simultaneously nothing changes and everything changes (laughs) this is this is yeah luke this is the new heaven and the new earth okay so you have this teleological new heaven and new earth the destruction of all things, but you, it's fractal, right? When, when you reconcile things, multiplicities, particulars, when you bring them together in your own life, in your mind, let's say, suddenly you're living in a new heaven and a new earth, right? Nothing is the same anymore, mm-hmm. right? Yet everything is. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is, and this is what reconciliation does, right? Reconciliation creates new heavens and new earths every single day. It does that. Uh, so you, this, is that it then? That like, uh, it's the evolution of consciousness and our consciousness now is such that it sees the world as. Divided. Divided. And when we get to the place of, let it be the world will cease to be divided if everyone does yeah and that's and that's well, final participation i i think i think so i think so and it sounds really simple 
But how hard is it? Like, just think about that task. To- well, right, right. It's exactly like walking on water. This is what I was thinking. To, in order to walk on water, you can't even you can't even be thinking about this. Like I watched last week with, for family movie night, I watched the last samurai with the kids and they're, and I love Japan the movie samurais and stuff. And it's, it's a little violent, but don't judge me. Don't judge me. Listen. <laughs> um, and, and my wife was working, so it was just my choice. <laughs> and, um, and there's a point in it where he's learning to sword fight, you know, cause he's the samurai are bad. Right. And they're the ones that that he's fighting against. And he's hired as this American to go fight against after he's killed all the Indians and he's drinking himself to death because himself. (laughs) Um, And uh, he's, so he's going to train and he gets kidnapped essentially by the samurai, but then he's living with them and he starts learning to love them and he's learning to fight with these wooden swords. And something that they say is he's fighting and he can't ever like beat this guy and can't do well. And then they just keep saying no mind, no mind. And it's essentially like, get out of your head. Like you're, you're thinking about it. And when you're thinking about it, you can't do it. Mm-hmm. Like you can't react. It's like riding a bike. It's like playing. It's like doing any skill when you're in your head. This is Polanyi, right? Subsidiary mm-hmm. focal integration. When you're focusing on it, you can't actually do it. You can't play. Yep. You can't sword fight, whatever. No mind. But that's also the walking on the water, right? If you're sitting there thinking like chaos, water, like I sink in that, like you'll, you can't do it. You won't be able to do it. So then I was thinking earlier when we were talking, I was like, can I even imagine, like re- existentially imagine, theoretically I can imagine, but like existentially, can I imagine stepping out of a boat onto water and having no thought of sinking? Like, I don't think I can. No, I can't either. I can't think, I can't think, I can't, I would be dishonest to say that I could do that. <laughs> right. Right. You right. Know. And I, it's unfathomable to me. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's what it takes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's a trip. Yeah. yeah. But that, that's like being caught in your frame or being present. What you're talking about. That's the frame problem. That. Yeah. The, pro- <laughs> the problem is being aware of your frame and, and. Um, yeah. You're stuck in your head. Like that's yeah. the thing. It, it, it's like, it's a little bit like Piranesi, and that's another reason I like Piranesi so much, or like the Green Lady, but not quite, because the Green Lady in Paralanda is a little different. But like she wouldn't even, this is why she was such a confusion and so confusing to Ransom constantly, is like all the stuff that he normally was thinking in his fallen self, his inwardness, his looking down, his analytics. Fallen, fallen. Right. All of that she just had no experience with. So th- she was just like, why would you think that way? And like, she just couldn't understand. And then he'd walk her through it. And that was, that's what the whole book is about, which is why I love it so much is this dance of like an unfallen consciousness that could really go either way. Mm-hmm. Like it could go, it could go the way of, of mankind or it could not. And like, that's what that whole book and all the dialogues are about that. Mm-hmm. Cause she's just like, She's in total harmony with the world and the animals just come with he's her letting, and carry, he's, carry he's her around. Letting it be. Yeah, yeah. exactly. He's letting it be, right? And, and, you know, we say fallen, but we don't think about what that means. We think we fell from a throne. Mm-hmm. We think we were kings and queens and we, now we're peasants wearing filthy rags. <laughs> right? And, and no, we fell into the the multiplicity we fell in we sunk down into our into our frame if you want to put it that way you know we stopped looking up we fell right down and um oh shoot there was something else i wanted to say um anyway i i forgot <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's what peter did on the water he fell into yep. the water yep. right and and oh that's what i was going to say you know people say well you just have to keep your eyes on christ yep mm-hmm. it's so annoying to me <laughs> because <laughs> what are you looking that, at right what is christ that's right. my question what is christ what are you looking at they're saying that almost still within a frame problem 
because they're just like, you just have to be thinking about that. You just look at the Jesus doll. Or you just have to will it enough. It's like, yeah. or something. Yeah. You yeah. That... Focus, focus on the little Jesus man there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Sorry Jess. The magic trick. No, but that's, that's another whole part of it is, is like, we think this is all something to do with our will. Like we're, we'll will this and correct it and we can manipulate it and do it. But um, it has more to do with the heart because if the heart has a, you know, if the heart has a reason, there's no, nothing to stop it. Um, well, what you're, I think, I think when you're looking at Christ, you're looking at the Tao. Yep. If you want to those terms, you're looking at the let it be. Mm-hmm. You're looking at the reconciliation of the coincidence of opposites, mm-hmm. right? You're looking at the unity and the multiplicity. You're looking at all of it. You're looking at the perfect human being who did not judge. That's what you're looking at. Nobody will, Sherry. He's going to come back with a sword. <laughs> He's going to judge. That's what it is. You haven't. Let's Jordan Peterson 2.0. Right. Jordan Peterson 2.0. No, it's well, not 2.0. That, that's the, that what I meant. That's the Jordan Peterson 200 level classes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'm not that's minimizing a- Christ to a, a philosophy, okay? Like, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not saying Christ is the Tao, but the Tao is Christ. Mm-hmm. Right? Um because God is everywhere present, filling all things. So, <laughs> you know. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote a book on it too, if that triggers people. Yeah, and, and that's why that's why I'm not going to call it bad or wrong. Okay. This is the there's I always um, I anticipate because I know this culture and I came out of it kind of the. What, what I would call like the, the dualistic, analytical, deistic Christianity that's, that's in this mode of judgment and choosing all the time of um, like I hear in my consciousness Congress, all the retorts of like when we're, when we're saying different things and I just, yeah. but like, to me, that's, that's the problem. That spirit, the spirit that has the immediate impulse to come in and like want to start making divisions divisions and judgments and analyzing that analytical impulse is the i don't know that's the that's what i was talking about with chad this morning after i watched his video as i just said the and that to me is the frame problem is to be stuck in that world that prison made of thoughts and all that an- analysis it actually means that you can't actually listen to, to anyone because you're constantly analyzing it you're reducing it to what you know rather than wanting to open up to this, to the thing that you don't know, you know, the, yeah. the thing that is outside in your periphery, it's the looking up. Like you have to look up if you're looking down all the time and analyzing, like you're stuck in that world. Right. You know, I, my dad was, I was visiting my parents yesterday. And my dad said to me um, that uh, the church that he's been preaching at, has grown because some Baptist pastor refused to stay closed during the COVID mandates. And so half of his congregation left. And I said, and I said, Oh, that's interesting. And he said, no, that's bad. He shouldn't have done that. He lost all those members. And I said, well, maybe that's good. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Who the hell knows? Who knows? Who knows? Right. Yeah. And that's where, like, it's great. And I guess I would say for myself, it's the judgment and the analysis is fine. Like this is where there, one of the passages I was going to read earlier is from first Corinthians that I love to it's first Corinthians 11. And Paul is talking to him about, um, you know, divisions that are going on with him. Um, and he's saying, you know, he's talking about their, you know, eating a communion and all this is happening and they're not doing it right. And he says, but in giving you this instruction, I do not praise you because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it for there must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Mm. But those, 
the words, the Greek words translated division and faction are different. And so to me, the way that I've always taken that is, is kind of what we're talking about. It's the difference between judgment and opinion is that Paul's saying, like, of course you must have opinions. Like everybody's going to have opinions. Like that's how you, different people have different opinions and that's how you see what's evident and you have conversation. Yeah. yeah I mean, but like there shouldn't be factions. It, sh- it should never, it should never divide you. If your opinions divide you, then like you've missed the whole point. Like that's not what it's supposed to do. Of course you're going to have opinions. Yeah. This, this, okay. I want to just make a mental note. So I don't forget cheese, cheese, cheese. Yeah. Cheese. And, um, and, um, condemnation. Cheese okay. Cheese and condemnation. Cheese and condemnation. Got it. <laughs> Bookmark it. This is why Jesus says he, he has not come to bring condemnation. He doesn't reject, right? Like this is the, this is the problem I have with cancel yeah, culture, for example. Cancer. Right. Yeah. Because you, you, when, when you reject a person, you cut them off from the ability to transform you and them. Yeah. You separate them off and they shrivel up and die. And so do you actually, because you don't have that ability to interact with them. Right? What do you do with heretics, Sherry? <laughs> Burn them at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just letting my consciousness Congress out. Right. The Bible yeah, what's, says. What's a heretic? I got a whole opinion on that too. But um, because in my opinion, we're all heretics. We don't know the essence of God. And any attempt to express it is heresy. Woo. Because we really don't know. Bookmark right? that. Bookmark but that. Back to the cheese. <laughs> Easy. When, when, when you were reading that, portion of Paul there, I thought of making cheese. Perfect. I love it. Right? You 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 put the rennet <laughs> in into this solid mass of milk. You drop the rennet in and it just separates. It's right? amazing. Yeah, I and, saw that and, happen. Yeah. And and it doesn't it doesn't diminish anything actually because everything has a purpose. The curds for the cheese rise to the surface and yeah. you can scoop them off and you can make cheese. Mm-hmm. And then you've got your way, mm-hmm. right? And you can make all kinds of things with your way. Yeah. It hasn't diminished anything. Everything's Which still- is better, the milk or the cheese, Sherry? <laughs> we need to know. Are you-, <laughs> you couldn't have the cheese without the milk, Luke. So there you go. <laughs> but that's what I thought of when you were talking, when you were reading that passage. I'm like, that's like making cheese. <laughs> I love you. You should write. I just a good idea for the book that everybody tells you to write that you haven't written that you will write someday. Probably would just you could just be like farm theology. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Goats and the sheep. Yeah. The sheep. Curds in the way. Curds the tears in the wheat. The left and the right. <laughs> there it is. It's all in there. <laughs> it's all part of the farm. The unity of everything. <laughs> It is. Have, have we done it? How long have we been going? We don't want to. Like an hour and a bit. An hour and a bit, yeah. That's probably I think good. We're good. I was going to ask you, Jess, I don't know if you can do it or not, but can you edit in that Chinese farmer story to the beginning of this video? Yeah. We can do whatever we want. Hell yeah. Can you edit like me, but like make me hotter? Yeah. Just put a big orthodox beard on, Luke. That would look awesome. It'll just take (laughs) off your mustache. (laughs) Just a razor. Just edit in a razor coming in. Yeah, it'll actually be shaving you during the video. So, like a like a Disney magical razor. Like I was just gonna say that mustache is growing on me, but it's actually not. It's growing on you. Growing on me. Talk about something that needs to get cut off, (laughs) thrown into the fire. (laughs) What's that mullet thing going on? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah.
that. No, this was good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So no judgment. Yeah. No judgment, no. Don't judge us. How many judgy comments are we going to get? <laughs> well, this will be the most judged. Um, yeah, I want to... I want to tackle sometimes just like, um, I don't know, the, the whole the whole thing in, that you brought up about, I can't remember names anymore, Ilyosha and Ivan. Ilyosha and, and Ivan. Oh, yeah, that I, would be a fun conversation, actually. Because that's so intense. Um, and, and then how to work in... Um, because if it all has to do with being and and somehow, I don't know, like it, because he makes the argument that it's better for that little girl not to ever have been than to have gone through that. And I think the counter argument is it's better that she is, that she, that she, that she got to be. And I, I don't know, that would be an intense conversation. That What's one, that we, we could bring in too because it's something i've talked about a little with cal but i think it would be an interesting connection with that but like the son of perdition it would have been better if he were never born no? yeah yeah that too and job and job so, talks about of course not job. wanting to be born <laughs> <laughs> job's everything i just let say job is I mean, everything it Job kind of is, is everything, and I don't understand how it's in the Bible, and then no one knows anything about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's because it's like it's like God. It's 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 everything. So they made it nothing. Well, and Sherry, you said before it's like it's like if people don't understand it, they're just like, well, it's just kind of complicated, and God's in charge, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh. yeah. That's that's when you lift the rug and you just go. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Jerry! Also, you gotta watch Tree of Life. No, I know. Oh, well, I need to watch that too. Yeah. Have you not seen it, Jess? No. You know what? It that in uh, in Tarek, what's the movie? Thin Red Line. There's that one. The main the main character, soldier. He doesn't judge anything. I oh, okay. brought that's that. a. I mean, that's a huge Malik thing. I mean, that's a hidden life too. Yeah, because he is. He is Throw down your your uh, your hypothesis for for um, Franz Jägerstetter. <laughs> for what? Luke has, Luke has a hypothesis about Franz Jägerstetter in a hidden life that oh, I think yeah. is absolutely true. He didn't judge the Nazis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and what's you know interesting? To... I... Oh, go Sorry. ahead. Well, the, the reason I can I can resonate with that because. When he has that inter interaction with that older Nazi guy at the prison, he's actually loving him by not judging him. Mm -hmm. And and um, and that and you know it because he the man sits in his chair. He wants to rest in that in the in the place where he sat, where Franz sat, because. It was, it was like Pilate when Pilate said "Ece homo." Mm -hmm. It was the, being the true human being, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's almost like that bringing together of opposites is is like, it's that it's that concentration without effort. It's the work, yeah, that it's play because you don't have to. You can just let things fall, and even though it may suck, you don't have to. But the one thing interesting about the a guy in the thin red line, so at the beginning, like he he uh, he's like with the Islanders, he's like just chilling out with a, another soldier buddy of his. They've like gone AWOL from their right. <laughs> from their division, and they're just like lounging around, eating and drinking and hanging out with the with the local Islander people who live primitive, and he's just talking about the unity of all things. Then, then the MPs come and get him and they haul him back and then they go and do this sort of ground invasion or whatever. And there's this interesting part where he talks about, he's like, these are my people. He's like, 
talking about the other soldiers. He's like, these are my people. This is where I belong. And like just after he was out, like with the people on the Island who were just like talking about the oneness of everything. And then he talks about how, how those guys were his people. And then like at the very end, he, he gives his life for them by, 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 uh, I forget exactly how it happens, but the Japanese ambush is kind of come sneaking in from behind and he's, he's the only one that spots it. And so he actually ends up dying, uh, warning everyone of that. And, and I'm just like, you know, there, he could have made a judgment against the other soldiers and been like, been like, you, you idiots, you don't understand the oneness of everything. I saw it with the Islanders or whatever. He, he never did that. He was always. He was present wherever he was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He was also Jim, Jim Cavaziel, wasn't he? The guy that played Jesus in the <laughs> Oh, he was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. For sure. It's a very, I don't know. I feel like, and you start to see it just kind of everywhere. It's like the prodigal son when he comes back. Well, this I is, mean, this there's, is there's no awesome. words of judgment. It's not like, what the hell were you doing? Yeah. And I mean, just that example that Jess is giving there, he was all things to all men. Yeah. Right. Paul talks about this. Yeah. And like, I, I've often wondered what it would be like to have lived, you know, in, in the crowds when Jesus was walking around, you've got this religious mindset and, you know, of the Jews. And then you've got this pagan culture, right? There's a mix of all kinds of things going on and other forms of Judaism, you know, the Samaritans, you've got all these people, but they all have a frame. Okay. They all have a way of perceiving the world. And then along comes Jesus and he's just darting in and out of everyone's frames. <laughs> right. Hanging out with Jesus is the frame problem. Talking to the tax Jesus is the frame problem. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, and we think we can look back on that and say, oh, isn't that lovely? He loved everybody, right? But what would we have thought of that at the time? Because I hear that kind of language now. I hear the charlatan language about people. I hear how it's not necessarily good to be all things to all men, right? And, and so would we have... I think we would have thought of Jesus in the same terms, honestly, if that's the way we want to move around in the world. Okay. If that's, if we want to make all those judgments, Jesus is going to break all the frames. Okay. He's going to smash all the frames because what he's doing is reconciling, right? He's knitting things together. Right. And, and, and nobody's going to like that. Nobody is going to like that. Yeah. It's no wonder he was crucified. Well, and even Peter, when he Seriously. when Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to get crucified. And Peter says, no, far be it from you, Lord. And then that's, that's when. Bad. That's bad. Yeah. And, and that's, that's well, when... and, and Peter saying, you don't have to suffer. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> um, my wife was doing like a Bible study about about Jesus temptations and in part of the Bible study, which was really good. was talking about how, how in a way Satan didn't want Christ to suffer. He's like, he's like, Hey, you're hungry. Turn these stones into bread. You know, you're uh, you, you don't have to go and die on the cross. Just bow down and worship me and the nations are yours. Like he, he was trying to make it really easy. Um, and I don't know. There's something in that that's there is something in that. Actually, I'll give you a, 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 a little a teaser, a teaser trailer for tomorrow. <laughs> well, for that... the, no, not that kind of teaser. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. We don't need that teaser, Luke. <laughs> Luke's in his tidy whiteies, like, damn. What kind of what kind yeah, of video is long. this? Um, I'm laughing embarrassedly. Um no, we're going to talk about something in in the um, in the meditations on the tarot tomorrow that you have to you're going to have to watch that conversation because okay. 
interesting. And, and yeah, I've thought about that too, when, when in the, in the, in the light, in the context of what we're talking about with judgment, because like Luke said, Peter's calling what Jesus is going to do bad. Right. Yeah. And, and so he's, he's casting apart what Christ is doing as a whole. Yeah. He's trying to separate it up into little bits. There's a good part and a bad part, and you know, We'll, well, we'll do all the good things. We'll yeah, leave out all the bad stuff. Things. Right. And, and, um, um, and that's when Jesus calls him Satan. Mm-hmm. When he starts casting things apart. Right. Mm-hmm. And parsing it up. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, like my niece said to my sister once. She lied. She was a little kid. And uh, my sister said, are you lying to me? She said, no. I'm just telling you the nice truth. <laughs> <laughs> the nice truth. That's funny. It's <laughs> a good line. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys watch Peterson's video on perception? It just came out a yeah. couple days ago. Yeah, yeah. That's probably what Chad clipped in his video. Yeah, it was. So yeah. freaking good. Yeah, I'm But gonna watch. He, he gets to the end and there's something... I don't know. There's something about the end that doesn't, he doesn't quite nail it. And I don't know what it is. He's, he's like all the way there. And then he gets, goes and he goes and he says what he thinks, but it, like, I feel like everything's kind of building, building, building. And it's like, uh, what does he say? I mean, well, he, he's almost, he's almost, <laughs> he's a little bit too mystical where he, he just sort of is like, Wait a minute, uh, does not compute. <laughs> no, no, but it but it's like it's like he uh I don't know. It'll take me a minute to describe, but he was he was like talking about um perception, the problem of perception, like how do we perceive things and what how do the meanings come to us? Mm. Um and then you know, describing that basically the 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 FOMO, not the FOMO, the 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 nasty postmodernist. Um, no, the, the mofo honest. mofo pomos, not the honest mo- pomos. Um, they want to say that basically it's just an imposition of will. That's mm-hmm. how you how perception is made. And so if we just will something different, we can perceive something different. We can perceive yeah. everything different. And then um, he tells a story about. And it's it, it basically just gets down to like you, the spirit of Christ is how you perceive things. That's what he ends up saying. And I'm just like, what does that mean? Yeah. It's my question. Well, that's, I mean, essentially from my understanding that, but that would be what the early church father said, like starting in just martyr and then rift on with, um, I think Maximus is it. That's the, the logi, you know, the logoi, the logo seeds, they are the, they are the unity, the mystical unity mm-hmm. that holds everything together. They are the unity in everything that makes a thing mm-hmm. a thing rather yep. than, yeah. rather than the multiplicity. Yep. And so in that sense, like it brings the multiplicities together. So in that sense, everything is Christ. And that gets into like, yeah, yeah. my panentheism is that it is and it isn't that's kind of the non dualism. Like that would be my line between panentheism and pantheism, but it's Christ in him. We live and move and have our being because the Christ is what holds everything together in which being happens. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so that's the Indra's net. Yeah, it's that, but that's also how you, I mean, but that is perception. I mean, that gets into Barfield because that is perception in of itself. Like that is the, the figurations of the unrepresented, the representations, like that's it. That's you see the whole, you see mm-hmm. the essences. That's what you see. And that's formed in action. That's why you see a sit- sitting place or you don't see a hole. You see a falling off place. You see the action. Well, yeah. You see well, the and, unity of it. Well, and if, if that's the case, then, then you can see what is transcendent. Yes. Because yeah, you can participate in it. Yes. Yes. And, and then that's what's being present means. And that's yeah. what, that's what that, that, and, but that kicks you out of your frame. Well, that, that's yes. because when you're present, you're, you're, you are 
imp- you, a, you are being, okay? Right. Being, you know. So you have to, the world has to be, you know, all like, this is the look around, right? This is the look up. Yeah, yeah. You know, which, which includes, it, it includes yeah, your frame, right. but it includes this other thing too, it's which both. enables you to both. see beyond. Yeah, it's both. Yes. Um, and, and to only say you can see things through a frame is yeah, incorrect. Right. right. No, that's actually not even seeing. It's that not is, true. That's just stuck in your thinking. Right. Because that's not actually how perception works, which is why I've always liked Barfield, which is why I don't think Paul understands Barfield. Right. Because that's what but, saving the appearances is. Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking about, of course, George McDonald's quote that, you know, the world is man turned inside out. Right. So, yeah. um, and I actually think that a lot of what George McDonald talks about is what influenced Barfield's thinking about this as well as Steiner. Right. For sure. And, um, and so how do you express yourself or even know yourself if you are not aware of, if you are not present in the world, right? Yeah, because like, like there's a sense in which you have to trust the transcendent, like I was saying about like how, how, what we think God thinks of us or how we think God (laughs) sees us. If we, if we see God as someone that basically is judgmental towards us or someone that we should fear for all kinds of reasons, like that'll basically it's a distrust in that transcendent where, where we have to understand that the transcendent though terrifying and uh, overwhelming and, and awful full of awe um, is fundamentally good. Right. That's pure easy. Right. Right. And so, there's, you have to have the trust in the transcendent, but you also have to have the trust in yourself to go beyond your frame, to well, be able is, to use that sense within yourself, which is something like your heart to push you past your own, your own limitations. Right. Because yeah. if you don't trust yourself, you'll never get out there. Right. And, and also if you don't trust the transcend, like those things for me are like tied directly reciprocity right it's so if i if i if i'm afraid of like myself and i don't trust myself because i made bad decisions in the past and my heart is corrupt and full of sin and deceit and which is all true but you can also say this nine jess the heart you can also say about about everything out in the world you can say there's all sorts of things to deceive and to kill me and to harm me and and but that there's something else beyond that. And there's something also deeper within me, which is sort of the image of God. Well, this is, and, this is Piranesi. Like this is Piranesi just yeah. because the rooms are dangerous. Some yeah. of the floors are sloping. The ceilings are falling in. There's huge tidal tsunamis coming in, you know, yeah. and, but the Piranesi is held by the, by the house itself. Yep. Right. Yep. He is, he's Giborgan in 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 the security that the the house affords him okay he's held by this kind benevolent house and every room has its set of dangers but he lives in complete bliss Mm -hmm. literally he's in bliss because he knows that he's carried yeah right and there's a there's a level to that too that like this is why i think the fall both very big picture but also existentially is important you know through the douglas harding phases because it's like being held by the mother the baby doesn't ever fear the mother's going to drop them you know it's the gorgon thing but but yet you have to come to the place of self-awareness where you where you know yourself you know the mother you know there's a difference there Mm -hmm. and then still trust in being held while while not just having that well, then what happens what happens luke is the child suddenly develops a fear of falling <clears throat> right okay when it sees there's a differentiation yes right? then it just then it becomes a fearful that it falls yep he talks about the sage and the yep. sage is where the toddler and the and the and the and the experienced elderly person come together okay yeah. and what that is is they know that they'll fall but the 
but they are also good Morgan. And that's Piranesi. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That yeah. is what Piranesi is. And that's why Piranesi appears childlike in yeah. the story. Yeah. Right? He's oblivious to all the suffering that he's going through. He's happy. He's always happy. Yeah, I am free, Franz Jaeger Shetter. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And there's a scene in in a hidden life. Well, there's 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 actually he plays on this a lot, I I noticed, where Franz is in the prison or at home or whatever, and he's always looking up. He's always looking into the clouds or into the distance. Yep. He has this really like huge vista in front of him always. Yep. And his wife is always in the dirt. She's grabbing, there's this one scene mm. where she's just grabbing the dirt, you know, or she's digging and digging and she's crying and she's, you know, because she's bound to her multiplicity, right? All the problems that she has because her husband is gone. Yeah. And, he's, and he's also been condemned, right, by his fellow villagers. So that puts her in, the, in that camp. And so she's dealing with this multiplicity and he's just, he's focused on the unity, right? Mm -hmm. That that, I think, I think that's pretty um, um, intentional in the film. Yeah. He sees, he sees the goodness that he can't understand because from an analytical perspective, nothing he's going through is good. And this is where like earlier, I was going to say this too. This probably gets into like our earlier, one of our earlier, multi-day intense debate slash discussions of Abraham and Isaac and where Nate, I don't know. I think I'm still different than Nate in this regard is I don't, I think Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, trusting in the goodness of God, legitimately thinking he was going to kill Isaac. <laughs> and Nate's yeah. just like, no, well, I think he had to, I think yeah. he had to believe that actually. Well, he I think to. otherwise there's no point. Right. Well, there's, yeah, and there's something, I don't know if this is necessarily true to the, to the time, but, but there's something about, like, I bet there was a temple he could have gone to, to have Isaac sacrificed at. There was human sacrifice going on. There was probably some sort of God that he could have taken Isaac to the temple, had him sacrificed, or he'd done the sacrifice, whatever. But instead he goes to the mountaintop. Why? Because he, he want he wants to go see God himself. He d- he doesn't want to go to he he wants to make sure it's the one true God that he's going to go do this for. And and this is a this is Abraham taking his frame to the limit. He's yeah. going to go all the way, and then it's only there that an angel appears and the ram is in the thicket. Yeah. You know, and. Th- that's the transcendent breaking through. And like all of a sudden you're in a whole nother world. The like, interrupting God. Yeah. It's the interrupting God. And, and how do you move from one world to another? You have to go to the yeah, edge. Get to the edge. You got to get yeah. to the edge. And then, and then something appears there. And that's cur- courage and humility. That's, that's yeah. the impetus for that. And, and, and that people what Christ did, right? Christ yeah. had the and the humility to stand before Pilate and say nothing. Okay. Yep. Yep. And, and what, what kind of Christ would he have been? Had he, had he believed that he wasn't really going to have to die? He just right. had to go emotions. Right. Yeah. And, and for religious people, it's hard because you have to go to the end of your belief system in order to actually reach God. Yes. People, people, you know, there's a way in which God is in the tradition and in the obedience and in the, the, the practicing of, of these things that have been passed down to us. God's in that also, but, but until you get out of that, it, it's only hearing you, you never get to see God and you, you have to find some, some kind of mountaintop that you're going to meet God at. And it's a lot of work to get to, to the top. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what it, like Abraham, like hiked for three days and it's just probably was terrible. The <laughs> three days and nights, like how do you even sleep at night knowing what's going to happen in three days? Like, it's just going to be like, maybe didn't. Yeah, he didn't. And, and, uh, 
Yeah. Maybe that maybe that's just it. Like he didn't judge it. He didn't, he didn't. I, I can't see that he could judge it, you know. He wasn't going to say that what God was asking him to do was wrong. And he right. wasn't. Well, he couldn't absolutize it. This is, this gets into like the opinion thing versus the judgment. Like he had his thoughts about it. I'm sure he didn't well, want to do afraid. it. That's why it was a struggle. He was, af- right. he was afraid, you know? Right. I mean, I'm afraid to, to, to shoot a goat, you know, mm-hmm. imagine having to kill your own son. Like, of course you're afraid. Right. But, but, um, You don't but want to kill your I, kid. I think the only thing. What was that? <laughs> I had to make a kid joke. You don't want to kill your kid. <laughs> I do want to kill my kids sometimes, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now you just doubled down. <laughs> That's the right kind of doubling down when it's a double entendre joke. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, what, what, would, what was I going to say? I was going to say something about... Um, Oh yeah, the, the the lack of judgment on on. I think that's the only way Abraham could have done that in true faith. Yeah, that's it's a really good picture of that because he because it's both of those things. He yes. had his duality opinion. He yeah. didn't like it, which is why it was a struggle. Otherwise, he would have just done it without thought and just been like da da da, yeah. you know. Psychopath. But, so he had his opinion, but he didn't absolutize it. He didn't yeah. elevate like his credo, his, he didn't lean on his own understanding. Yeah. He didn't elevate his map above the transcendent reality, which is faith. Right. Right. Or iconic vision or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. 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 Good. Well, we did another part. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do a third part. Let's keep going. <laughs> is this the second part of what? I don't know. We're just like, keep recording. Oh, just within this. Yeah. We kind of had like a lull. We're like, we're done. Two hour hour zone. Yeah. So you could, you could do part one and part two. (laughs) Just kidding. I'll just edit together the best parts. (laughs) No. (laughs) All of a sudden, all of a sudden I'm in like a Terrence Malick film and like, I couldn't even make the cut. I'm just out of it. It's just me and Sherry talking. <laughs> it was like he said he said to make him look better, and so we just removed him. Uh, 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 we think the best look for you, Luke, is we tried getting rid of the mustache and we just yeah. decided to get rid of it. Yeah, we got rid of we got rid of the mustache and it just got rid of Luke. There was nothing yeah, left after that. We started that. with the eraser and you were just like, eh. 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 No, that was all he was. He was just all mustache. And when the mustache <laughs> left, he disappeared. You do that. Just have a mustache. Use <laughs> my mouth. Oh. Um, Dad will maybe make funny clips out of it. Yeah, we should make this as surreal as possible. And then. Oh, man. Is this, are we going to do randos since randos has been. Yeah, probably. Nine. 